Well, I'm sitting out here surrounded by the crickets at the very end of August, August 31st, 2018. A spectacular summer, uh, the world getting weirder and weirder uh, as we move in toward the 2020s. Uh, me kind of becoming both a hermit and a public figure out there doing a lot of talks about the origin of life and space and engines of creation and healing arts and things like this. Uh, but at the same time, in a, in a sense, uh, wanting to be Gandalf finally in his wizard's keep uh, and shutting the world in it, all its weirdness out. So I'm running this kind of dichotomy uh, about that. So more on that in the future. But um, here in the neighborhood, it's been hot and cold and big fires in here in California. And I took an opportunity to go and see my dear old friend, my oldest friend here, Alan Lundell, who has a hot tub up on top of what they call Future Peak. And he's Dr. Future in the Dr. Future Show. And you've heard uh, me and Alan many times on the Levity Zone. And we, we really had a, a wonderful reconnect after many months in the tub, and I brought him up to date on Shepard, on our balloon bag, bag the future, uh, asteroid capture spacecraft, uh, which you've heard about before from me many times, but it's really advancing now. After years after the TEDx talk, it's now advancing. I met with a team back in the East Coast last week uh, who were interested in funding a CubeSat flight to actually demonstrate uh, the key parts of Shepard. So we sat in a hotel, had a bowl of clam chowder, as is traditional for the Shepard project, and uh, I then drew out this bag capture or test of a small meteorite as a stand-in asteroid on a CubeSat uh, mission for low Earth orbit for this new crew. And we'll see where that goes, but that's very hopeful. Those kinds of things can happen in a couple of years, and they're in orbit and transmitting video and showing how you might manage the little pebble, a pebble in an inflated bag. And then Alan and I dove uh, out of headspace uh, back, trying to find our way back to heart space to softer matters of the heart and of being here now rather than just talking ideas to give you a little bit of relief as listeners of the Levity Zone. And I talk about a little bit about my practices of turning my head off in the morning when I get up and it's just racing. The worry about getting things done kind of dread uh, and the kind of breath work and work that I do to go back to peace and presence and the smell of the fresh morning air and some bliss and time slowing down and you can do this too you can you can shut the system down tell the mind and the worry meter to just take a take a trip and trip down to zero for a bit and allow the rest of your system to express and be just be and, of course, we then drift back into space subjects. So what else is there to talk about? Because uh, i just come from NASA meetings back east where we talked a lot about life on exoplanets and origin of life chemistry and things like that. And so I was full of it, literally. Uh, so we, we went back to that and ways to settle the solar system and back to Shepard, of course. Um, but... As Alan said, well, it's nerdy stuff, and it is, and uh, uh, it's something we like, and I hope you here as listeners of the Lev Levity Zone like it too. So without further ado, here we are in the bubbly world, of the Tubcast number four, uh, with Alan Lundell, Dr. Future, and your Dr. Bruce uh, up on Future Peak. A dual recorder. There you go. Isn't that great? Yeah. Stereo, stereo. Stereo, stereo. stereo. So great to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you too. Woo. It's hot. Oh, uh, my goodness. Uh, oh, my goodness. So this is going to be Tubcast number 
four or five or the levity zone. In the levity zone. All right, I hear high atop Future Peak. Yeah, and Alan and Son have just returned from Quebec. Quebec and Ontario. Quebec, ça fait. That's it. <laughs> and you uh, have been uh, in Rhode Island, the last place you were at, right? Rhode Island, and I met with yeah. two, two fellows who are interested in developing Shepard. You put it in a baggy asteroid project. <laughs> put it in a baggy asteroid project. And, um, and yeah. one of them, who's a wonderful fellow named Mac, who's interested, he's a wealthy construction guy. Yeah. And he's a space aficionado and very knowledgeable. Uh -huh. And he, he wants to fund a CubeSat. Which oh, is, yeah, CubeSats. Yeah, I just did a story on a CubeSat. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, art. There's a CubeSat art. It's going up now. Giant mylar balloon that yeah, glints I, in the sun. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, we had a big lively discussion last week about that. Uh, some people think it's schlock. Others think it's, you know, so the, great art. So the CubeSat for yeah. Shepard, yeah. which will do something real, mm -hmm. uh, we came up with a design, which is simply attach an inflatable bag onto the CubeSat yeah. that has a meteorite in it already. Yeah. That Peter Janiskins will give us from his collection. You so send the meteorite back in space. Back in space, <laughs> and so the bag will inflate because of a sublimating powder. Because this is how the Echo One satellite was. The two big balloons that NASA launched in the '60s as telecommunication reflectors. Uh -huh. They're called Echo One and Echo Two, and those were filled with a gas just coming out of a powder, not a canister. Powder. A powder. You can heat up the powder and it releases gas? It releases gas. Uh -huh. And so, super simple, the CubeSat, which is only 10 centimeters on the side, yeah. has communications and stuff, an antenna, mm -hmm. and a gyro to stabilize mm -hmm. it, and then, mm -hmm. almost like a lunch bag, inflating, mm -hmm. releasing uh, a little, we call it a nano-neo, or a miniature asteroid, which is from space originally, and it'll be floating around inside the bag, and on four corners or five surfaces of the bag, there'll be a cameras, lights, to measure the distance, because the rock will initially be tumbling and bouncing around inside the Are you going to try to stabilize it, uh, de-spin it and all that? Yes, so yeah. what we can do is take little laptop fans, the tiny little ducted fans that laptops have. Yeah. They're very efficient and they're, they're very reliable, and each one would have its own batteries. It'll be, it'll be a blister with a camera light and a laser rangefinder and uh, this little ducted fan prop that can push a little pulse of air into the uh, bag, into the Shepard balloon. And so if, if so the Nano Neo is, is on one surface, you can actually just run these little fan bursts until you lift it off and then run the fans until it's centered. Right, so you, you have an algorithm that can give you the right combination of fans to push the uh, little... Yeah, or allow people to try to do it from the ground like some game of 3D Space Pong. <laughs> yeah. So it'd be like Space Pong. It seems like it would be want to constantly bounce around uh, just on initially thinking about that. Yeah, so the challenge would be to center it and stabilize it. Mm -hmm. And then when you do get it to that way, it'll be literally like astronauts in the space station, they sort mm -hmm. of they spin objects for the camera and, and they yeah. have blobs of water. They do it all the time since Apollo, sure. they've been doing that. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me, what, can, can you also do an experiment on the space station? You could, but then you'd have to get it all through the approvals process. And, oh, I see. So you know, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. So if we can get on nano racks or something like that and uh -huh. get something built, it could fly in a year or two. Uh -huh. And literally, we would have video of a little asteroid inside an enclosure being managed by gas. Which Super is, simple, yeah. which is the whole idea. And Shepard is that scaled up very large where you capture the asteroid instead of bringing one along and then you encapsulate and then you manage it with gentle wafts of gas. Well, I think you can get a, a, a you can get on a, a, a CubeSat for $50,000. But to develop to develop all the tech and test it and test it, and you probably have to send a handful of them to get one to work. All right. So, yeah. I mean, the solar sail, you know, light sail, they had a mission loss on the first one, and then they got the next one to work, and they're doing the second one now. Hmm. So it took about 
eight nine years. Well, wow, that's it's. Uh, yeah, it took a while to perfect the solar sail. You know, the Times Ferry Society did that. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's good. Wonderful project. And, so, and Light Sail Two is going up. I think this year. Really? That's a, that's yeah. a uh, citizen science project. Yeah, it's a planetary society with donors and mm -hmm. crowdsource, and that that's a real model for for us actually. So we could crowdsource Shepherd and get get people to donate and raise a few hundred thousand dollars. You know, we go a long way. Yeah, I did the drawings yesterday of the bag design. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I did the drawings and and I've sent it out to the group and and uh, we could crowdsource it. On, and our, our good friend Mac might be able to put some money in. And um, we need to find aerospace engineers, build a prototype on Earth, and try to inflate it. You know, Get put it in a vacuum. Oh. Yeah, stick it in a vacuum. Try to inflate it. Just make sure all the systems work. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Key element. Yeah, it probably make several generations of the bag and inflating gas and then the internal sensors and because you could suspend a little pebble from within it and you could test it with just a suspended pebble. Right. Yeah, you know, I can see that. And you could turn the pebble and you could swing it back and forth and test it. It could easily be done just in a vacuum chamber. Yeah, just test the whole thing ahead of time. Oh. Huh. So this would be uh uh uh, it's sort of a proof of concept yeah. Um, yep. idea on a CubeSat, mm -hmm. actually in space, and uh, from there you could uh, apply for the budget to get the, the big one. Yeah, so, to, so then what you'd do yeah. is, you know, that YouTube video would stand for years, and eventually, you know, that would build interest, like, oh, this is what it is, yeah. and then a larger investor would have to come in and, and start investing long term, because you need... You need a couple of decades to perfect the technology. So you can initially do a mission to go and get some space trash from orbit that ha is, is where it's a known location. Right. Capture it and then bring it down and maybe deorbit it or, or uh, just bring it out of where it is, you know, clear the area. Uh -huh. Or you can encapsulate a satellite and move it with, with gas pressure. Uh, for servicing, so bring it from one orbit down to low Earth orbit, where a crew could go and and service it. Now, would you uh, be able to um, du duplicate the capture process with this model as well? You wouldn't be able to do it with this one. It's already got the the rock inside. Rock inside. The, so that would have to be another process. So the next the next yeah. missions beyond it would be the fetch missions. Because all the themes in Shepard are dog themes. Go so get it. Go get Shepherd, it. Shepard, right. Go get it. Go get it. And, yeah. and so Fetch would actually release an object. Yeah. And then go and encapsulate it and capture it again. You know, do it multiple times with a seal closure and yeah. trying to manage it. So that would be the next stage for a scale model, a really small one in orbit. But then that would develop all your basic technologies. And you might have to fly five or six of those to really perfect it and then gradually get bigger. And then when you're ready to get a large object, you could throw one out of the space station, um, mm. bring it back to the station, and then the arm would, would grapple onto your vehicle that has the object that's been retrieved. Hmm. So it, it could be almost like a, a bubble drone that goes out and catches stuff and brings it back to the space station. Right, exactly. You're right, it's a drone technology, really. And then, you send a mission to determine an orbit of a of a real asteroid, and that could be an object in what's called a Trojan point, mm -hmm. which are the front and back of Earth's orbit. There's collections of these objects that are probably accumulated there. Yeah, it's kind of like the uh, the, the sea gyres of plastic. You know, there's right. points where they just collect. Exactly. The Trojan points are the, the Trojan points. Junk collectors of, uh, of orbit. Yeah, and so then you probably have to send a mission to to give you the exact orbit because it's difficult to determine where these things are, and and you really need to know precise orbits. Hmm. So you need to have what's called an orbital determination mission, and think of it like a prospector. All right. And then, uh, uh, isn't there a service that that uh, tracks all the space junk uh, there, you know, that's already out there? Like there, space command or something. Yeah, and there is, and you could mm -hmm. actually use that service to go and, and and do a test where you collect some of that. Right. And then right. move its orbit. So that would be of interest to a lot of people. Yeah, space junk collection mm -hmm. uh, seemed like an easy idea to grasp by many. 
and then you could be going for space rocks or you could maybe get a billion dollars from the Pentagon to go and get some of its old spy satellites. They don't want anybody else to see it. <laughs> or that they want a service. Because the Pentagon's very interested in satellite servicing. But they've got all these proposals for like robotic systems that do uh, robotic servicing. They're really big and complex. Yeah. So, so Shepard, and this is my friend at Lockheed Martin, told me that Shepard would be perfect because it would encapsulate a large satellite that could be the size of a school bus. Really? And, uh, oh. and then uh, my friend at Lockheed said... Well, if you, if you can go and envelop a large satellite, like a keyhole satellite, yeah. and you might be able to grapple onto it, but better would be to try to manage it with gas, because you have a big solar collection surface on the outside. Hmm. And so you use that to run pumps that pushes gas at the satellite, and it's what's called a delta V, or a change in velocity. Mm -hmm. And then that gradually could deorbit it, you know, bring it down to a lower orbit just by this continuous pressure. It takes a while, though, for that process, right? It, it takes a while, and you have to thrust out the back as well. You have to equalize your spacecraft with what's inside it. Yeah. So if you push on something inside the balloon, you have to actually keep up with it. So it takes a while. So it could take a year. Uh, who knows? Uh, no one's done the calculations. But, but when this satellite is brought into an orbit where, say, a crew using a SpaceX Dragon could be launched, and then they could dock, they could, this is really cool, they could dock with the back of Shepard, go through an airlock, mm -hmm. that would be the heaviest part of it, and then go into the enclosure, and by that point you've grappled onto the satellite so it doesn't bounce around, mm -hmm. and then go in with, uh, without spacesuits. Because you've got a 50%, say 50% Earth atmosphere there. Hmm. Just like the beam module on the space station, which is the Bigelow inflatable that's on the right. station. Right, yeah, that's one of the other inflatable experiments, that, the space hotels. Yeah. Yeah. And then they can go in just in their, in their pajamas and the tool belt and do the servicing without using a robotic manipulator, without using spacesuits or MMUs or something. And then they could, you know, potentially fuel it or, or replace modules and then and they would put more gas into Shepard because that provides thrust and then they would just take it back out into its intended uh, orbit. Uh, so, yeah. so a transporter unit. Um, now how, how important is it for the um, the asteroid not to touch the surface of the Shepard, the bubble, the surface of the bubble? It's really important because it, can rip it, right? it will rip it apart. So you get yeah. all this momentum and then you get yeah two objects that are now tangled up, and, and it would be quite disastrous. And that would be the end of the mission, really. The end of the mission, and that's why the NASA missions for the, what we call the ARM, the Asteroid Retrieval Redirect Mission, Yeah. Uh, when they showed their concept, it showed a bag closing down on an asteroid, and that's a dumb idea. These things are usually rotating, they're usually tumbling and spinning a little bit, mm -hmm. like one RPM. Mm -hmm. So if you close a bag down, now you create all this force on the object, and so loosely held boulders start coming off or moving around, and then the spacecraft is whipped around because it's now attached to something that weighs far more than it does. It's attached so to the, a fabric bag. And so it, the bag actually comes down and touches the asteroid? In, in the, NASA the NASA proposal. proposal. And, yeah. and Peter told me, when, as soon as he saw that, he said, it's just ridiculous. I mean, you have to detumble and de-spin the thing before you can clasp it. Otherwise you have all this angular momentum and it'll just rip the mission apart. So that never was realistic. And yet NASA sort of put that out as a public a thing, which is kind of kind of ridiculous. Which huh. they do. I mean they make mistakes. You know. Yeah. That's that's why they have outside people to correct them sometimes like I I sometimes am doing nowadays. So these are all my typical nerdy topics, but um <laughs> Okay, let's go. Let's go to one that you want to um, explore a little bit more. Well, what's what's a more soft topic that's less hard nosed? Um, yeah. What's what's an easier one on the on the uh, the human heart and the human soul yeah. than this stuff? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Well, there's quite a bit. Um, I mean, we're looking at how to you know transition to a, a world where we're we're at peace with each other, right. you know, and don't have these constant wars going on, and 
and mm-hmm. then the conflict on social media, which seems to be like a war zone a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, the war zone. Why, uh, why can't we all just get along? <laughs> <laughs> you know, are we, are we are the bio- biologically programmed to do this? To, to struggle? To, to fight for resources? To Well, I think it probably goes back to, in a sense, we're all in a network that triggers our needs our desires, you know, advertising is supposed to trigger desire, guilt, yeah. right? So we're constantly hammered by, we're not good enough, right? So that's one terrible thing um, that most people are facing. They, they feel like they're underachievers and they're being extracted from by the system all Well, the yeah, time. it's because we're programmed to believe we're born in original sin instead of original bliss, I think. Right, right. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's something wrong with you right from the start. Right, but and that, that gets the muggles working. You know, this <laughs> gets them up and gets them going to their cubicles. Yeah. But that it's empowering for organizations, perhaps, or, you know, getting services done and whatnot, but certainly crushing of the soul. Yeah. What have you found to be most liberating, or how, or how do you liberate yourself from that, that process? What I do is every morning that I'm smart, anyway, which is sometimes not a lot of mornings, yeah. I get up and my mind is spinning. My mind is like churning with, oh, I'm worried about getting this done today. Because my, my mother, the mother who raised me, Enid, who you've, you've met, yeah. uh, she was always worried. She always had lists of things to do and she was always worried about getting them done. And that sort of transmitted to us. And to have kids. a list? You always had a list? Yeah, I always had sort of a mental list of tasks. Mm-hmm. Um, and a certain amount had to be done every day to feel good. There was sort of a doom and gloom thing if you didn't get these things done. And, <laughs> and, and that's a very Protestant thing, right? Yeah. So it's not a bliss thing. It's a very yeah. muggly thing. Yeah. So what I've learned to do is in the morning, I do this uh, yoga, this stretching, mm-hmm. and then I do breath work, pranayama, pastrika pran- pranayama breath work. And partway through that, my mind shuts down. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly everything's bliss and good. Mm. The, the world is good. I'm looking. Usually, I, I look out the door to see the mountains and the trees, and now I can smell the air. And like suddenly, time slows down or stops, yeah. Yeah. and there's peace. And there's none of the worry. There's none of the task. It's like there's a peaceful time, that as far as I know, has always been. And then I start from that place. Mm, like to, the memory you know, of what you need to get done goes away for a moment. It goes away, and it can go away for several moments which is enough time for the system to calm. So Mm. the little parts of me, the little children parts of me, which were panicked because teacher was panicked about getting their lessons done and stuff, suddenly the little children, and I'll sing to them. I'll literally, I'll do sighs, I'll do laughter, and I'll sing, and in my body, then all the parts calm down. And because they're being sung to, and there's a whole different dialogue is then going on. So the mind is shut off, so it's not taking all that energy and attention. And now the parts are being sung to. They rest. Mm. And now everything's okay. So my sense of panic was artificial anyway, you know. Yeah. yeah um, it's just the code you were running in a sense, huh? Yeah. yeah. And of course, yeah. There, there can be real things mm-hmm. that are real, real panic. Real stressors. Sure. Real stressors like, you know, bulldozers are going to knock the house down. I mean, that's a real. <laughs> right. But most of the time, there really aren't real things it's all made up yeah fears and tasks I put on myself and it doesn't actually help me to worry about a writing deadline because Mm. that just takes energy Mm. and so after I come out of this breath work and the singing and everything I get a little insight of what to do today first and maybe different than my worry mind had listed Mm. and that one thing I do solves several other things all in one shot like Oh, I need to write and ask this person to help write this piece. That solved that right away. Boom, done. And then I'm so clear that I write the email and the request, and I get an answer right away because I've got huge clarity and peace. So it's not coming from desperation. It's coming from, oh, this is how I would approach this person to help write this paper. Yeah, yeah. And then, boom, it's done, and they feel good, and suddenly, so a hard problem gets turned into an intuitive heart-based, relaxed, natural, like, synchronistic field thing. 
Can you stay in that space and get work done? Yeah, yeah. So what what happens is I, I start spinning out of it. Yeah. Right. I'll start spinning out of it, but because I was in that calm space, the spin out's not as hard as it was. Mm. It's not as harsh. Like it can't take me over completely. Mm. And then I'll take more breaks than I would. I'll feel better. I'll breathe better. Because when you stop breathing, you create anxiety. Mm. So people get up and they look at their phone and their computer right away, hold their breath. And that creates anxiety all day. Just holding your breath. So breath is really a, breath. one of the core things to pay attention to. Right? Yeah, and like right now as I'm talking, I'm not taking enough breath. you got such great air. And so, because I've been talking too much. But <laughs> if we take a big breath, all the podcast listeners take a big breath. You see how I've slowed down a bit. So I'm not... Da, 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 da. <laughs> and it, it's better. So everyone can feel like, oh, well, he, he got his he got his stuff out onto the recording, but now it's, you know, that's a little bit much. I mean, thank you for all these ideas, but it, it would amp up the listeners, too. They would get all amped up by trying to digest all these ideas. And then they'd be spun out a little bit. And so it actually can be good i mean that to have be excited about ideas and talk about what we've just done but it does spin people out and dissociate them uh yeah you get out lost in the ideas and lose the connection that we have with each other and, and it's not good to lose connection right <laughs> well it's a little lesser bandwidth you know it's more your own thoughts at that point yeah and you just become as you used to call it to certain people in our community stuck on transmit <laughs> <laughs> Someone who would come up and just talk, 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 and they were stuck on transmit. <laughs> I feel like I'm one of those stuck on transmit people. <laughs> well, there's certainly a lot of stages for that in our culture. You know, that we seem to have our educational system based on listening to people. Uh, but I do think there's something to be said for interactive communications and learning. You know, yeah. you know, which is not really the model yet, but maybe it could be. It maybe could be. Because so. the interactive computers are more. You know, the kids seem to really like to that more than to classrooms and teachers. Yeah, I think they get stuck in mental state because computers are so visual yeah. that they get stuck up in their heads a lot of the time in a visual kind of a thing. Yeah, they have the interactivity, but they don't have the heart. They don't have the heart. So, yeah. so that's where, where a living teacher, one-on-one, -on -one helps. So where does our civilization go if we become all Spock's brains? Well, there's a sci-fi story. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? And I, I've just come from this NASA thing where I was a Spock's brain for five days, so that's why I'm... <laughs> Apologies, yeah, apologies, <laughs> listeners, because you can see that I'm still spun out into Spock's brain mode. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. It is what it is. Right? It is it's, what it is. Yeah. yeah. It's it was the, fun. It was what yeah. an experience. My goodness. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and you bring these other levels to the conversation there. You know, your California experiences. Yeah. You know, which are, don't even need to be said. They're just implicit in your presence. Well, I, I, I bring the visionary state yeah. So these like yeah. um, large kind of system thinking, like what do they call out of the box thinking in the East Coast? You know, because <laughs> right. they're all in boxes. I don't know. <laughs> well, everyone has their training and their professions, and it's kind of isolating in some ways. When you say, yeah, yeah, like, uh, and like I mean, they're all connected, like like branches on a tree, but but they're still they don't necessarily cross pollinate. Very, as much and these events allow that to happen yeah and you you, yeah. you you get a real bond with people I mean there was a lot of emotion mm. and there was a lot of humor and jokes and you know yeah. not not at anyone's expense just about the, the whole complexity of the process of the audacity or the absurdity of trying to figure out the origin of life <laughs> with all these experiments right and 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 most, mostly we don't know. And so it's like... Experiments. <laughs> What's well, called hand-waving, you know, in yeah. science, when people are waving their hands back yeah. and forth. Maybe something will happen like this. That's yeah. right. Or, you know, the, those guys at the blackboard where the equations end and they said, and then a miracle happened and then the equations go on, right? <laughs> you know, we just don't know. Just give me one miracle, I think Terrence used to say, right? Yeah, just give me one miracle, right? What was that? He was... Uh, the Big Bang. Right. I don't know, did you ever did you get into any cosmology with these guys in your spare time? You talked about stuff like the Big Bang. Or A little bit, yeah. Origins of existence itself. I, mean, I, I did with Terrence. 
Well, I, yeah, but I'm talking about, about the scientists in Rhode Island. Oh, um, not really. No, no, it was very dialed into what's in front of us. But we did talk about innovative space architecture. So I talked about Shepard to a fellow who's working on Osiris Rex. Oh, yeah, I just which, did a story on that. Which you just did a story yeah, on. Yeah, it's for Bellis. It's approaching the asteroid Bellis, right? And it's it's uh, gonna Bennu. Get s- Bennu? Bennu. Bennu, yeah. Bennu, that's it. And it's collecting samples. Yeah. And so taking them back to uh, Earth. One of the fellows I met was one of the principal investigators. Uh, and I've known him for years and years, like eight years or so. And I said, how's it going? And he said, we're on final approach. Wow. So literally, they don't know what Bennu looks like up close until they get up close. So, uh, the Hayabusa mission, which is Japanese. Japan, it, it they have to, one too. That's like that, and it's coming. They're arriving at their target in uh, December. Yeah. And if there's a huge number of boulders uh, that are peppering the outside that have attached themselves to it, it can become problematic hmm. to get a sample. So they just don't know where. But they have their choice. I mean, they can go. They have this foot or this thing that will go down and suck material in. <laughs> really, like a little vacuum. It's kind of. It's kind of like this this circular probe that will go in and pull material in. Mm. And because they have to put it in a capsule, and then that capsule has to, mm. you know, at high speed, it will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and get picked up. Mm. It's a great mission. I mean, it's... it's, it's so they're having a, a capture mission, um, and we're having one? Yep. Um, this is the era of asteroid exploration. So then there's there's also one... New Horizons, uh, gone out to Ceres and Vesta, and Ceres is, is like a protoplanet, it, it's mostly water ice, or largely, uh, a yeah. large amount that has more water than the Earth does. I think it's a few yeah. hundred kilometers across, yeah. but it contains more water as ice than Earth does at the surface. Well, as an origin of life researchers, what would you look for on the, on the asteroids? Water? Um, you, uh, you look for the building blocks of life. So amino acids, acids yeah. amino acids, uh, fatty acids, or carboxylic acids. And these are emergent uh, things, or things are found on regularly found yeah, on Yeah, they're they're made in cosmochemistry. So they're made in dust clouds in, in between stars, huh. and nucleobases, which are important because they're one of the elements for nucleotides. Which, when you attach a nucleoside to a nucleobase, you get a nucleotide, which then can form a chain. And a nucleic acid. So you'd be looking for these things in the samples from uh, these asteroid probes. Yes, the the type of asteroid that Bennu is is probably not one that has a lot of that material, although the, we just don't know. We could just so, to see what's there. Right? The ones that are full of organics, well, one or two percent organics, are called carbonaceous chondrites, hmm. and they formed at the beginning of the solar system. And Dave has a pieces of uh, the Murchison meteorite, which is older than the Earth. Huh. So the Murchison meteorite is a carbonaceous chondrite that fell in Australia in 1969. And Dave was uh, doing a sabbatical in Canberra, and he was able to get a piece of it about wow. 10 years later. Huh. And we have it in the lab, and they're very, very extraordinary because you can grind up an interior, like an interior space, grind it up and put it in solution that forms membranes immediately. Really? Yeah. Really? And it's older than the Earth? It's 4.6 billion years old. It's just older than the Earth. So it was huh. formed as the, the, the accretion disk. Of the solar system. The solar system. So wow. here's another cool one. Uh, at this meeting were two uh, people who study exoplanets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's quite a bit going on in that field. Yeah. yeah. So well, what was exciting there? Well, the Kepler mission has found, you know, these... They're still processing data from Kepler, even though it's no longer uh, giving us new data. Yeah. And but it, there's tests... There's right, there's tests, and there's uh, other missions planned, and huh. it's a golden age of these exosolar systems. Yeah. So I, I sat at a table with a young researcher from University of Washington, yeah. and I said, you know, we have a model for how life can start on land, what are, what are called subaerial or beneath the air land masses, and it can spread into microbial communities, like which it did on the Earth, from the land into the sea, and then gradually changed the atmosphere, putting oxygen in, removing some things, until you can get complex life. And that could take billions of years. But we have the first real testable model for the origin of life now. And that actually informs the exoplanet search for life. So, for example, if you know that you're in land-based pools, yeah. you know the kind of energy available, yeah. 
because the star is emitting the energy that you're mostly using. And these guys can actually tell through these glints, these little flashes, potentially where there's ocean on, on the surface of these exoplanets. And they can actually work out the changes of intensity of light coming through the atmosphere that might tell them there's continents there too. So mm. there's, there's ocean and continents. Because there's continents, then they can look for signs of life. But way, the way you would tell whether an exoplanet has life on it is you'd only be able to do it if it has complex life that has changed the dynamics of the atmosphere, changed the composition of the atmosphere, which might be imitable. Or some gases that it made, like right. biological life, like, like, like methane sniffers. Methane like sniffers, that. oxygen, yeah. free oxygen, and that complex life will keep a planet habitable longer that most planets become uninhabitable at the surface, like Mars or Venus. See, so it's um, anti-entropic, you know, if you will. Yeah. Uh, it's evolving rather than slowly decaying. Right. The planet that have a dwell time is longer, can keep its surface water longer if it has complex life. And it may be a general principle that if you don't have life, hmm, you just interesting, you yeah. can't keep your surface water because you need a dynamic system. So you look for planets uh, that have the most complex chemistries then? Yeah. So the chemistry of Titan can be very complex, but it's super cold. So it's not going to have it's, life. It's though. probably not yeah. able to have life. So it's a cryochemistry. So yeah. it's, it's a organic petroleum <laughs> atmosphere. <laughs> so wasn't there, I mean, and you used to go to contact, right? Contact yes, consortium. still do, yeah. Uh, yeah I've been to yeah. a couple myself. and. And I, uh, it's not unheard of to create life forms that live in the atmosphere of Jupiter right. and stuff. Like Imagining that. that, yeah. Now, now, looking back on that, is all that purely imaginary? It's purely imaginary. I mean, an advanced thing that could fly, I mean, but you can't get molecules together very easily in an atmosphere, so you can't start life in an atmosphere. You can't start life in rock. Yeah, you need, a, liquid. You, you, need need a, a, you need another miracle, I think. Yeah, you need another miracle. Another miracle like crystal life. Or something but, that, and crystals it, crystals yeah. grow, but they stop growing when they run out of stuff to grow with. So they're not generating. Yeah. And ironically, life uses a liquid crystal called lipids. That's your cell wall, uh -huh. which is a form of crystal, but it's liquid. It's like a liquid crystal display. But geology uses solid, hard crystals to grow. And that's where the life diverges from geology. So you use a soft, squishy liquid crystal that can self-organize and eventually creates these units that can make its own building blocks. Whereas mm. whereas geology just runs out of building blocks and a, a salt crystal just stops growing. Mm. You know more salt to to crystallize. And interesting, yeah. But and and yet geology is one of the ingredients for life. Yeah, and geology is a participant and geology is yeah. affected by life. So actually your bones, you know, your head, your your skull is appetite. It's an actual mineral made by cells. But appetite's also made in geology. So biology making stones. It's making stones. <laughs> so maybe, maybe biology created the planet. I well, mean, maybe we have it all backwards. Well, biology influenced the Earth. So yeah. there's like five or 6,000 minerals on Earth yeah. because of biology and water and all this complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in Mars, there may be a few hundred minerals. Because Mars does not have complexity to... to yes, yeah, so much simpler. So that would suggest it never evolved life then, right? Yeah, I'm going down to the Mars 2020 landing site meeting in October. It's the fourth meeting. It's our final vote. Three yeah. landing sites left yeah. for this big rover that launches in a couple of years. Huh. And well, and we have one shot at finding evidence for life on this mission on the surface. Interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm on the Columbia Hills team, yeah. which is unlikely to be selected because we already visited it with a rover the spirit rover which found uh, evidence of an old hot spring there right with the hot springs but, yeah, but my understanding is that they're all excited about um, water at the poles uh, uh, and they probably want to check that out well these missions will go to the equatorial region because that's their profile oh really so this is an equatorial launch or yeah. an equatorial yeah. mission. big heavy rover uh, so the two other sites one is sort of an escarpment called northeast Sirtis, and the other one is called Jezero huh. crater and it has basically an outwash fan delta that was emptying into a lake in the crater. So the, the delta's sitting there, and there's no water in the, in the crater anymore. Hmm. 
And I think that that will probably be chosen because they can land on that. They can drive all over and see different boulders of different ages and types. So they have lots to look at. Yeah, yeah they mm-hmm. probably won't find evidence for life because in just random boulder fields on Earth, you don't find organics and you don't find evidence for stromatolites. Yeah. But you, you find them in these, these escarpment or cliffs, formations formed by hot springs. Yeah. That's what, what does the preservation of those textures. Uh, are they going to be launching a, a drone on this one? Yeah, they added a drone. Um, so that's an exciting kind of crowd-pleasing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, maybe you'll be able to discover caves, you know. Uh, you know some, well, it will, won't fly range, right? very far, you know. Yeah, it's probably won't fly as far as your drones. Uh, yeah, well, the atmosphere is 100 times thinner, right? Right, and there's, so. there's frequent winds and dust devils and so it, it'll be it'll be quite a thing though. I mean, it'll it'll yeah. prove that that can work. Huh. I wanted to add a rock hammer. Um, right? Is, are you still suggesting that to them? Or? No, no. It, it's far too late. But when I was in New Zealand, I, I mentioned this to Tara Jokic, who's our young and upcoming yeah, geologist. Tried and true geology tool. Tried and, <laughs> right. Basically, the the rover doesn't have the typical geology tools you'd use if you went to the field. What do they have? A hammer. laser. They have a laser, they have a, grinder? a coring thing that can pull a core out of a rock, okay. put it in the sample cache. They have a drill, okay, but those them. things all kind of grind up the surface and you can't see a fresh surface of rock with that. So if I went to the Pilbara, I would take my geopic, they call it, and I'm breaking rock all the time and looking at the broken faces. That's how geologists work. Right, right. Well, I guess, I guess you have to work a little differently now that you don't have that tool. Well, the rover probably can't detect stromatolites. Because, because it, doesn't, it doesn't have that tool, right? It doesn't have that tool. Unless you can figure out a way in which the drill can find it. or, or Well, it, uh, it's unlikely. So about a year and a half ago, I woke up in bed realizing we can't break rocks on Mars, and I went to see people at Honeybee Robotics, uh-huh. and I drew it out, this idea of a percussive driven by a spring, and they actually pull out a Venus drill that they've already developed to, to go through the rocks of Venus. And it's it's like jackhammer. So yeah. jackhammers are springs that get compressed up a, a camshaft and then they drop off the camshaft yeah. and they drive a, a point down. So that's how a, a, that's how a jackhammer works. Yeah. Sometimes they're hydraulic. So we literally sort of sketched out a little one that could fit in the carousel and be picked up <laughs> by the hand. So I, I showed this to Tara and yeah. she said, let me design a whole rover. So by the time she did her talk, she had drawn out in Illustrator the Geo Rover, uh-huh. which not only had a, a hand percussive chisel, it also had the idea I had, which was a strike hammer that comes off the bottom of the vehicle to break a slab underneath or a rock. Mm. And she also had a saw that would cut rock so that you have a, a clean face that you can blow off and then you can do what's called mini SEM on it. And uh, you can do a whole lot of science that way. So you don't need to ship the samples to Earth to, to do that kind of work. You could actually have a saw that would work on Mars hmm. easily. So I'm hoping that her generation, like she's just getting her Ph.D., that in the 2030s, that'll be a mission. Like she got funded to develop the instruments over 10 or 15 years, and then she's on the mission wow. for the Geo Rover. Wow. Because that's, that's the only way it's going to happen as a young, a young person, a champion, taking yeah. it up. And, but meanwhile, with this one that's going down, uh, what, what's its primary mission? You know, all of our presentations. Right? Mars 2020 is supposed yeah. to search for evidence, not of habitability, but actually look for evidence of past life, because there'd be no current life at the surface. You mean like, um, like fossils of, of stromatolite, microbes? Like the, the stromatolite rock textures mm-hmm. are the only thing you'd see. And those are fossils, basically. Those are point. fossils. They're kind of like geological fingerprints left by by yeah. biofilms. But finding any fossils at all would be a breakthrough. Im- impossible. Right? So it, the, the only <laughs> fossil, because you'd find Seriously? what's called a microfossil, which would, yeah. because Mars would have nothing more than microbial life. It yeah, wouldn't have the, wouldn't have anything with bones. Based on the simple biochemistry or simple yeah. chemistry, there's and, no evidence of anything higher than that. Yeah, and Mars had a warm, wet period that lasted between a few hundred million years and maybe as much as a billion years. Yeah. And so in that time period, especially when the seas are drying up and the surface is losing its atmosphere and the soils are becoming toxic, they're becoming perchlorates, yeah. your, your, your life is going to be in retreat. So if it started at a hot spring, it would go down, escape to the subsurface through the plumbing of the hot spring. 
That's what go into the ground for it, to yeah, survive. To survive, and it would be in rocks with heated water, and it would just be living in the rock just like we have. Oh, a could, lot that, of. could that be at the equ equator? Uh, it could be anywhere, really. So, oh. But you'd have to drill 10 meters, 50 meters, something like that, in order to get into those rocks. And so they'd go that deep? Yeah, j just to find where there's water and where it's warm enough. Because if it's if it's icy cold, if it's most of the surface of Mars stays well under freezing. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like Earth in the sense that caves or underground will be a constant temperature. Be more of a constant temperature, and it's fed right. by the sort of nuclear engine. Yeah, what do you think it would be on Mars? Uh, like here, like in caves here, it's like fifty-two degrees or something like that. Well, it's not what I know much about, but I think it would be warmer than it would be. Mars has a nuclear it reactor. Would be warm world. enough to uh, keep water or liquid. Yeah, definitely. So it'll be above 32 or 0 degrees centigrade. Yeah, and as you get closer to Mars's core, it'll be hotter and hotter. Right. Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. It has a stagnant lid. It's called stagnant lid geology. So it's got hot spots coming up like Hawaii has, but it doesn't have plates going around. Huh. So well, it's very, very, you know, stolid uh, geology. Not, not a lot of change. But Olympus Mons was the biggest volcano in the solar system, yep. wasn't it? So that was a hot spot that erupted through that lid. And and just, it makes it, our volcanoes look small. Yep, it, it erupted for millions of years. And that's why we know there would have been lots of volcanic land masses on the early Earth, too, not just a big ocean. Because you'd have constant volcanoes as the Earth cooled. You need to have volcanoes and rifts open up to let the heat out. Huh. So, so if Mars did have volcanism, and it had water, it could have had hot springs. Hot springs, that, yeah. Uh, and that's what we found what at found Columbia Hills. Evidence one, right? Yep, yeah. evidence for were in Columbia Hills. And that, that uh, life tried to start there, and how far it got is anyone's guess. Anyone's guess. And it, did it get far enough to capture sunlight? Did it get far enough to make its so own proteins efficiently? To replicate itself? And if it's on a dying planet, its evolution is shortchanged. Well, at some one point it wasn't a dying planet, right? At one point it was a new planet. And Natalie Cabral, who's a well-known SETI researcher, thinks that Mars was already um, seriously leaving habitability after the first 400 million years. So, so about the time... shorter window than, than, very, than we did. Very short window. Because hmm. the atmosphere is being stripped away because it has no magnetosphere. It has no magnetic dynamo in its core, so it can't protect itself against the solar wind. So there goes your atmosphere. Hmm. And yet some of Martian chemistry has influenced this planet too, right? Has, has there been uh, rocks? A few a few found, yeah. Not a lot. I mean, there's probably Earth meteorites sitting on Mars too. Because <laughs> this stuff true. is blown off. and So there's a lot of cross-pollination from asteroid impacts and, and meteorites. And, it, and, and there's thought that maybe yeah. while life could start on Mars and then head to Earth, but that's an, an unnecessary complication because the life that's gotten advanced enough on Mars to survive a transit to Earth in a meteorite yeah. Yeah. would come to an Earth that was at a different evolutionary stage that may be fairly toxic to that life. Mm. So it's not very pre-adapted for the Earth system. Mm. And the Earth was far more viable for a start of life than Mars would have been. But maybe it had a piece to a, a solar system puzzle. Maybe it uh, provided something for us. Uh, it could have been that certainly it took a lot of impacts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then some of it spl uh, splattered on us. Well, Venus and Mars well, probably all helped stabilize our orbit. And that's another question, is Venus, what, it, it was a young planet once too, right? So yeah. it, 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 my understanding is that it had a runaway greenhouse effect, which made it the, the hell world it is now. But, but before that, before that... Mm -hmm. Could it have sustained life as we well, know it? Some models I've seen, had it had a liquid ocean because the sun is younger and not as bright. Yeah. And it would have had the same cooling that Earth had, so it would have given its its atmosphere lots of moisture oh. from cooling down uh, lava and magma and things like this. Hmm. And so it probably did have a liquid ocean, but then it was just that much closer to the sun so that would have made it hotter and... Hotter, faster, so the ocean couldn't stay liquid. So it evaporated into the atmosphere, yeah. and then gradually the hydrogen, which is a lighter part, is broken off of water, is stripped away. Huh. And then you get CO2, carbon dioxide. 
And here's the problem, if you don't have liquid oceans, you don't quench all the gases coming out of volcanoes. Yeah. So they soak up all these gases. So if you have a little bit of water at the surface, not enough, then the volcanoes continually pump in CO2 and other greenhouse gases into your atmosphere and you can never get out of runaway greenhouse. Hmm. So then after a few hundred million years or whatever it might have been, the oceans are all gone. All the liquid water is gone. It's all in vapor. Then it all becomes CO2. And then it becomes a heat blanket forever. Yeah. And we can see volcanism now on Venus. There's these great big plateaus and there's... Okay, well, here's what I was thinking is that if some primitive microbial life might, might have evolved on Venus, uh, I understand that some layers of the atmosphere might actually be friendly to what we would consider extremophiles, that they actually have a, an environment that could support some form of biological well, life. Well, the thing or, is, how do you... I mean, it's, it's again, it's a, a super... But they would have to escape to the atmosphere. You know, if they had developed, right. they would have to live up there and stay there until they mutated or evolved to handle other layers Right, and they would actually have to be extremophiles, which means yes. they're very advanced. So extremophiles means an advanced uh, very evolution advanced, of microbes very, already. So yeah. the, the microbe world, having extremophiles is an advanced It's an advanced thing. That's, state that's of, why the deep yeah. ocean vents are all extremophiles. It took longer to evolve them. It took longer to evolve them. So for yeah. fragile early life, for the progenote that we were talking about, yeah. so progenotes on Venus could have gotten started, even microbial communities, mm -hmm. But boom, as soon as those oceans were largely gone and the, the temperature went up to hundreds of degrees at the surface, it could have been. they're gone. I see. Yeah, so it's sterilized. Mars is sterilized by UV and perchlorates and, and a vacuum atmosphere. So the surface has become not just harsh for life, but sterilizing. So any, any life that's put there is an immediately sterilized. So it's a reboot of everything. It's a reboot. You couldn't grow mm. potatoes with your your shit in Martian soil. Oh. Now, the other thing, now, I, I, I'm researching this, I'm just kind of curious about the timing on these. My understanding is that the the runaway greenhouse effect of Venus, um, the beginning of biological life on Earth, and the loss, massive loss of atmosphere of Mars, is a catastrophic uh, event, apparently, uh, were all about four billion years ago. Yeah. Like four billion years was some kind of magic number yep, four billion, in the solar system history. Four billion to three and a half billion, probably. Three and a half to four billion years, and and everything happened. Then. Well, the, the, the so planetary formation generally happens all at once because you have this accretion disk and then star ignites and and stuff is pushed out. The star has taken most of the material, but then the planets are gobbling it up. So that happens in a relatively short period of time. Hmm. So solar systems form, but then they they move around so there's dynamism stuff reorganizes itself and stuff hits other stuff hmm. and then you could come into a period of stability and perhaps that was at around 4 billion 4.2 billion years ago this, the um, stability that what they call it punctuated equilibrium well <clears throat> more that um it's like the billiard balls are no longer influencing the other billiard balls they as slowed much things down they or, slowed things down yeah. There isn't more material to do planet building. The solar system takes a breath. Yep, and then it goes into a, a, a stable mode. And TRAPPIST-1 has like five or six or seven of these small rocky worlds. You know, it's a tiny solar system. But it's very stable because a, a red dwarf or a brown dwarf is long-lived compared to our sun. Hmm. And something like Betelgeuse is super short-lived. Right. It could be a few hundred million years, like a blue giant or something that's a binary star system, yeah. that has a real problem for planets because it's a super complicated orbits. And so there's nothing stable. So planets don't have uniform temperatures. Which biology likes. Yeah, biology probably requires. And the, and the, the planets can't be tidally locked to their star where there's only one side facing the star because then one side is super hot and the other is super cold. You know, so that only in the margins where you'd have maybe liquid water. So it's... So habitability, this is called the question of habitability, um, varies widely. And planets probably have hab habitability for short windows. And the Earth had habitability for billions of years through just happenstance because we had a big moon, we had 
enough water but not too much, not mm -hmm. too little. We're just at the right distance. We have a circular orbit, so our temperatures are... Yeah. We have plate tectonics, which can recycle things through the atmosphere. And we, we had stability, so mm -hmm. life couldn't control whether the water was kept, right? The water left on Mars, the water left on Venus. But it just happens that water stuck around here for all this time until life could get complex. And then something called Gaia was born, which is the little Gaia is described by James Lovelock. Now can she can put her finger on the thermostat. So if it's getting hot because of the asteroid impact or something, mm -hmm. life adapts and uh, takes the CO2 out of the atmosphere and you know, and, and, and removes the heat yeah. problem. Yeah, up to a certain point, but, but she wouldn't be able to adapt fast enough for Mars or, or, right. or for, for uh, Venus. Right, so it's yeah. just runaway. And so, so there's a certain amount she can adapt, and, and Earth is just perfect for that. And when life is in its yeah. microbial community stage, it, it can't really do much to the atmosphere. It, it doesn't affect the geology much, it doesn't affect the atmosphere much. It needs billions of years to get there. Billions of years in the sort of the womb. In the womb, and then it becomes mature, and then it becomes the Gaia system. Yeah. Becomes more like a self-regulating system, which only lasts for a short period of time. Like we're we're coming to the end of our period. Oh yeah. Yeah. According to Lovelock, is a hundred or two hundred million years from now there will be too much uh, incident solar radiation, and we're going to become Venus. We're going to flip into Venus. Well, that's why uh, Michio Kaku says we have to become a uh, Type 1 civilization. Uh, right. You know, which... And that's where Shepard comes in. Ah, because yes, yes. It's, uh, survive such things? Well, in Shepard, we make millions of worlds uh, by encapsulating them in membranes and, and turning them into worlds. Don't try to colonize the surface of a really toxic, you know, huge sink like Mars or the Moon. <laughs> and turn your own little, your little pre-experiment into a world. <laughs> yeah, no, you, every, every asteroid that you capture yeah. turns into a world, yeah. and, and it can be harvested and she, turned into a bio-world or an extracting of water or volatiles or minerals. Shades of candor here. Shades of candor? Yeah, can, candor is it's in um, the mythology of Superman. Okay. Uh, he came from the planet Krypton. And um, it blew apart, right? He and his father sent him off in a spaceship just in time. Just in time. Yeah, to get to Earth. And one of the cities of Kandor, they had very advanced science in, in, uh, in Krypton, and they were able to uh, put a shield around a city, a bubble around the city. Right. And save it, right? And so they were able to save it, but they became very small in order to save it. It became, like, tiny. And, and Superman went and retrieved the city, and brought it to Earth and put it in his lab ah. in the uh, Fortress of Solitude. That's and, oh, that's the Superman yeah, mythology. That's the, yeah, that's the mythology of Candor huh. in Superman. So it's a it's a city in a bubble, <laughs> which we probably won't be able to do very easily. No, no, but yeah, that's 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 our monkey imagination at work. Yeah, but I um, think picture this: mm -hmm. in 500 years, mm -hmm. the protoplanet Ceres or something much smaller yeah. has a uh, a shepherd membrane around it yeah. and it's been melted to an ocean and it has trillions of tons of biology living in it it's a 200 kilometers across globule lit by lighting on the outside solar powered and um, it's it's got zillions of life forms in there so it becomes a world yeah an ecosystem it's its own world, world of itself and it's within a gas atmosphere yeah and it's, it's a biosphere and that's one of the modes of shepherd. And you can send them out into the universe, seed the, seed well, the galaxy. you can feed them. from them. So people who build using the shepherd gas miner that pulls minerals out and does 3D printing yeah. through a carbonyl gas mon process will pop off these huge parts which will build Jerry O'Neill type space colonies. Wow. And the Jerry O'Neill yeah. type space colonies, whatever you want, uh, can get their farmed foodstuffs and chemicals from these biospheres. <laughs> and then the water, of course, and the, the fuels all come the same technology. So there are three modes of shepherd. Shepherd fuel, shepherd bio, and shepherd miner, which mm. mines through well, gas. And well. so it's, it's one technology that solves all the major problems of inhabiting space, of extending human civilization into space. Mm -hmm. It's a single 
invention. Nice, so nice. And you don't have to land on planets. It's a lot more you energy land. efficient. Yep. Um, you have a, a ideal environments that you create uh, yep. using principles of Earth and what we've learned in biology. And that was Gerard O'Neill's thing um, was you, yeah, the planetary society. surfaces are not good places to expand civilization. Right, yeah, and I think there's certainly nature will take that when it, you know, there are a certain number of the populace that will go for that. Yeah, and, and, and who knows, it, it could be a big political change. But doesn't it, it mean be... a different kind of body, too? I mean, you talk about biogenetic engineering for ideal life forms and that live in zero gravity. Well, you would rotate the structures because we just need gravity. I mean, and, until we're Until we do we're able to master biogenetic engineering enough to change yeah, our form. It... That's a harder problem, but just yeah. rotating a big sphere or a, basically a Jerry Purnell, Larry Niven kind of thing. Okay, so that would take us to a level, I guess, where we would be able to survive a, a mass planetary extinction. Yeah, so we would be spread everywhere, way beyond Elon's idea, his sort of cartoon kindergarten idea of a multi-planetary civilization. So you don't want to do that, because all the other planets in our solar system are toxic and huge sinks. So just create you, something really nice and live in it. You make worlds and you make megastructures. Yeah. Well, it seems sim simpler but ele and elegant, right? I mean, it is, and there's yeah. right now no motivation to do it. Uh, but we're working on the CubeSat anyway to demonstrate it so that in 2019 or 2020 there's this grainy video on YouTube, a thing called YouTube, that in 50 years someone watches and they watch maybe my TEDx talk yeah. and other talks and they watch this demonstrator and they actually go and they build the thing in or, 50 years from now. Or how about this? Yeah, that probably is something or like that. They listen but. to the levity zone <laughs> from the hot tub, uh, the tub cast. And they'll find out that you were you were putting out lots of CubeSats, and each of them were a piece to a larger puzzle, and that by the time they discover it, it's already been activated. Yep. And, and uh, they would, uh, if a bunch of CubeSats could communicate with each other, what would you have them say? What oh, What would you have well, them do? What kind of uh, biochemistry experiment could they do? Could they create a... a a higher form of life uh, or something like that? No, everything is super yeah. simple and our technology is just not up to most of this. Well, what's the most advanced life that you could do with a CubeSat? Oh, to have it on board? Yeah. Probably biofilms in some kind of a vessel or something. So a biofilm experiment of some kind. Then. Yeah, that's what they do on the space station. So yeah. where Shepard came from is an idea I had to collect with aerogels on the outside of the station to collect micrometeorites. Yeah. and take them out of the aerogels and see if uh, life can eat the substances to do a bioassay of aerogels. And that, that led to the Shepard idea, because then I realized, well, you could capture these particles with a kind of capture mitt, yeah. a great big parabolic fabric that would focus the micrometeorites in a cup. And then I realized, well, you could capture an entire asteroid this way and seal it. And then I met Peter Janiskin at Contact 2014, Mm -hmm. And together over a bowl of clam chowder, which we had another bowl of clam chowder in Rhode Island to talk about this this um, nano neo cubesat idea. So it's clam chowder is a traditional food of this project. Uh, but then Peter came up with the idea of introducing a gas like xenon to manage the object, and then to move right, it. Right. Stop right. And it how tumbling. do you put that into a uh, micro miniature form of the? Shipping? Oh, you just. Like we talked about. Fans, right? Little fans we're talking about. You, you have a yeah. sublimating powder that, that mm -hmm. turns to gas and that fills your bag, and then you have the fans that can move the gas around. Sublimating powder and computer. Computer controlled cooling, fans, computer -controlled lighting, cooling and cameras. cameras. And a camera kind of laser rangefinder that tells you how far the object is you know, from an edge. And so that would be all real time feedback. So there should be software that can actually literally center that object pretty quickly inside the bag and, and it could spin it up, make it tumble faster and spin it slower. Mm. And if you had a jet, these, these little things could either be propellers that just move waves of gas or they could have little jets of, of can gas. You, can you, uh, there's a, open, some people are using electricity for propulsion for small satellites. Yeah, that's called solar electric propulsion. That seems like a good idea. It'd be really slow, but it would maybe... Yeah. If you wanted to... That's how you would run Shepard to get it out yeah. to the asteroid. So you use xenon yeah. gas and a yeah. solar electric engine, and you use that to get yourself out, and use the same xenon gas in the enclosure to manage the asteroid and to move it around and to give it delta V, and the same xenon is moving both. 
and you're losing xenon to space every time you thrust, but you're using that thrust coupled into waves of gas that are pushing the asteroid. Huh. So as you thrust out back, you're pushing the asteroid inside. You never have to touch it, you can move it. Wow. It's a coupled system. Nice, nice. Yeah, really yeah. simple. And a future version of, of Shepard would release some gas out the back and generate uh, momentum or acceleration, and then the gas would attempt to to keep the uh, rock in the center of the bag. Hmm. And so that would be a test of driving force. Hmm. Yeah, so, the cameras would you know, be able to detect its location, a 3D depth yep. camera, change the speed of the fans to compensate in real time. And then, and you do it very slowly yeah. so that there's no sudden moves. It's very, very slow and gentle. Right, right. You have a lot of time. You have a lot of time. Thing. Yeah, and slow thing. your solar power, because there's solar blankets on the outside of the bag yeah. or or solar panels. Yeah, and then once you have propulsion, you can uh, go visit other satellites, maybe either connect up with other CubeSats with a bigger part of your experiment. Yeah, if you had enough uh, xenon on board. Yeah, that's the limiting factor, that's right? That's the limiting the factor is always your, your fill supply, but when you get in... It'd be nice to eliminate that as a problem. When you get a, a wet NEO, or an asteroid that has water in it, or right. other volatiles, you can then start extracting that and, and turning it into fuel. Yeah. So it can be self-propelling. Ideally, so, right. Yeah, right. So, so you're extracting and separating fuels and then you're using them. Well, the solar electric, solar could power the fans pretty easily. Yep. That part could be handled. That's all done by right. solar, but you still need thrust. The gas, the equivalent of doing a, a gas machine, couldn't that be done with a burst of a fan? Well, you still need to move the spacecraft, and you're in a vacuum of space, so you need to throw matter out the back end for like thrust. A photon beam? No, it couldn't do, couldn't do it that way. Propulsion? No, no you, you need to shoot matter out with a little engine like to, a real, to be able to move yeah, reaction mass. Or throw out real molecules. Huh? You have to throw out real molecules to create real movement. Hmm. Yeah. There were, we come to the, we came back to the... All the way back. All the yeah. way back. So, Alan, any final words for the long listeners of the Levity Zone before we switch to more informal conversations? <laughs> yeah. and well, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate the download. I know it sounds a little geeky in some ways, but that's because it is. And, <laughs> and, and, and there's, that's a certain aspect of reality. Um, I think you're, the level of the heart serves us well to talk about matters of the mind more, in a more connected way. And I hope that carries across in the podcast. Our connection with each other. Yeah, we, we have a loving. We do have a loving connection. Yeah. Al, twenty-four years uh, in conversation in hot tubs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm, I enjoy learning in the in public. It is a danger for them being an idiot at times, but that's okay. That's okay. And I felt like I was an idiot all last week, but <laughs> I think you have to feel like you're an idiot in order to learn because it, it makes you vulnerable. Yeah. If yeah. you express your vulnerability instead of defending yourself, then you ask for help and then you evolve <laughs> and learn. And that's human. Yeah. Human evolution goes starts with vulnerable self admission of uh, being yeah, an idiot. That's or, it. Well, more than calling yourself an idiot is like, breathe. I know nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just a zero. Zero. <sighs> you know, we may think we know something, but we know very no, little. No, I'm one with everything. I'm one. And I'd rather be yeah. one with everything rather yeah. than trying to know everything. You know. Yeah, it's, that's distributed intelligence. So. Yeah, it's it, it's chill jaw intelligence versus like, you know, know it all intelligence, which is a little bit irritating at times and, and takes a lot of uh, effort. <laughs> So with with that, yeah, we'll say goodbye to our listeners. Yes. Thank you for your patience. This is the August full moon podcast. Well, Burning Man is going on and right we, now. A year ago, we were at, at the Eclipse Festival. A year symbiosis. ago, and symbiosis. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful, the best festival ever, and and uh, so watch for reports all fall from all these things. Great time of year, and. If you want to hear more on my side, go to Dr. Future. Just search for Dr. Future, you'll find me. Dr. Future Show, it's like 500, 600 shows at this point. <laughs> Can you believe it? It's, it's been eight years. Eight years, eight years and yeah. they're all online. And and the the ones I'm in are at uh, doc, the Dr. Bruce and the Levity Zone archive at archive.org, live on the Dr. Future Show. Yes. M most of the time. Yes, and, and I often have weird stories come up, but I ask Bruce about them, and 
And I've got some this week, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Ah. I've yet to spring on them. Uh, but you want to hear Dr. Future Show. Listen in. Yeah. All right, so thanks, folks. Cheerio. Until next time on the Levity Zone.